had some issues with our speakers here. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All Hello, right. everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'll be getting started here in a moment. All attendees should be on mute. So, sounds like wind interference, so. We ready to go. All right, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Grice, uh, the director of the MBDA Center, Detroit, Michigan. And we are super, super excited today to bring to you a series on behalf of MMSDC, Michigan Minority Supplier Development Council, and uh, Michelle Sawyer Robinson as our host today. Uh, for the current and future state of minority businesses. And we will have on today uh, Director Henry Childs uh, out of uh, Washington, D.C., out of the Commerce Department. And um, before we get into um, uh, our segment and introductions, I'd just like to give you a little backdrop. The uh, Michigan Minority uh, Business Development Agency um, was uh, actually founded in 1969, 51 years ago. And uh, the agency itself is um, under the Department of Commerce and promotes the growth and competitiveness of uh, the United States um, minority businesses, including Hispanic and Latino, Asian, Pacific, American, African American, and Native American businesses. It is the only agency within the United States government that is specifically geared toward uh, growing and developing minority businesses. Uh, MBDA's stated mission is to promote the growth of competitiveness of minority-owned businesses by providing access to capital, access to contracts, and access to market opportunities, both domestic and globally. And today you will hear from our director. We are super, super excited. Also on the line today, we have none other than our very own Michelle Story Robinson, the president and CEO of Michigan Minority Supplier Development Council. Let me give you a little bit about Michigan Minority Supplier Development Council. We are a nonprofit of 501c3 organization committed to driving economic growth within minority communities. Uh, the MMSDC, as abbreviated, uh, advances the mission by uh, facilitating uh, over 26 billion in annual uh, economic output between corporations and certified uh, minority businesses. Uh, we also have had over a $36 billion impact uh, through our council. So we are super, super excited to have uh, Michelle Story Robinson on today. Uh, Michelle um, is, is, is a leader and uh, benchmarked uh, in this community throughout the world and recognized and identified as a true leader in this space. Uh, with the rapidly changing demographics of the United States, the minority business sector is arguably the fastest growing segment of small businesses. Ensuring the success of minority businesses will have significant positive effects on both the United States economy in general and the Michigan economy in particular. Um, Michelle Surrey Robinson brings to us the leadership and the education and backdrop of, uh, of uh, legal uh, by, by trade, uh, actually a, um, a JD. Uh, so she brings a host, a host of skill sets to our organization. And we are super, super excited to recognize her today as our leader and uh, setting the pathway and paving the future for change and economic impact. So I introduce to you today, Michelle Sawyer Robinson. Thank you so much, Michelle, for your time. 
Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that kind introduction. Bill has worked at our Detroit MBDA Center for the last probably two or three years and uh, was recently promoted to lead that center as a director. So thank you, Bill, for, uh, for that kind introduction. I'm excited that you've all joined us today um, in the middle of uh, this crisis throughout the, the, the country. We have um, identified many ways to um, help and celebrate minority business owners. Um, so really today's call was um, to ensure that we were doing that and providing this information. We rolled out a design series. Design series for us is akin to a TED talk for those of you that are not uh, familiar with it, where we created this design series about four years ago in our organization, really designed to uh, pull, no pun intended, really designed to, to pull from the uh, many resources within this community. Design stands for diversity, entrepreneurship, supply chain, innovation, global, and networking. So all of the topics in this series um, are really geared toward that. Early on, about uh, eight, nine weeks ago, we began to use our design series and leverage that to provide good content to you. We started with things as simple as former Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly coming on board to really talk about the Paycheck Protection Program, literally within 24 business hours of the legislation being signed before the first uh, applications were ever received. We've continued with that weekly and Bill and the team have done an outstanding job of ensuring that you had the latest and greatest information, that it was information that was actionable, because I do recognize that there are many webinars out there. Each week we, within this series, are bringing you new content. And some of that content isn't just content we create, but it's content that we have actually pulled from various resources throughout the country when we identify something that might be helpful to you. I invite you during today's call to take the opportunity to uh, ask questions. Um, you can do so through the Q&A um, button there at the end of your screen. You're welcome to ask questions. We have a moderator in that panel that will be going through the questions and will do our absolute best to get to each of those questions throughout this conversation today. We really wanted to take the time to talk about what is really happening with minority businesses throughout the nation currently, but what does the future look like? And we felt that there was no better expert to really weigh in on that than our own National Director of the Minority Business Development Agency, Henry Childs II. Um, I will be very candid with you. Henry and I have not always been on the same page, but I have learned and grown to have a deep respect for his um, true desire and commitment to the minority business community, his desire to bring resources that make a difference. Um, and I would like to um, introduce him to you to open it up with some remarks and then we'll go into a Q&A period. Be sure that you're actually on your system because we also have a couple of poll questions that you'll be able to answer from the platform today. Um, so without further ado, Henry was appointed as the National Director of the U.S. Department of Commerce's Minority Business Development Agency, as we refer to the MBDA in September of 2018. He is the 17th National Director of the agency, and in his role, Director Childs has been laser focused on getting minority-owned businesses to size and scale. He is doing that by starting an Enterprising Women of Color initiative, a Go Global initiative, and investing heavily in new industries and minority growth equity funds. Most recently, he has even invested um, in minority businesses by advocating on behalf of minority firms to be included in the CARES Act. So there's technical assistance coming to communities throughout the country because of his advocacy. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Henry Childs II, the Director of the Minority Business Development Agency. Director Childs? Hey, thank you for the warm welcome, Michelle. Uh, I really appreciate you having me. Um, you said we weren't always on the same page, but I know we were always in the same book. So that's good, right? Because, yeah. you know, what you want to, especially at times like this, you, you, you need to have people who think big and people who are visionary don't always agree on how to get there, but they always agree on where they're going. So I just want to thank you as a friend and as a leader in these times. So I'm just going to give a quick background of what, you know, I've been trying to do at MBDA, and then we can move into some of the CARES Act stuff. Because, as you know, when I first came on board, the number one data point that I was always focused on is that 
only 2% of all minority owned businesses have annual gross receipts of $1 million or more, 2%. But we also know that the nation's minority population is 129 million or 39% of the total U.S. population. And if you look at the population of five states, including the two largest, which are California and Texas, um, they're now minority majority states. And 21 of the 25 biggest U.S. counties by population or minority counties. So when you, when you compile all these data points, you, you know that minority population and minority businesses are growing at a much faster rate than their counterparts. But the question is, how do we get them the resources and the financial backing that they need? And so my two things have always been, you got to go global, you're going to have to reach more customers around the world, or you have to go digital. Um, and, that, and as we see now, those two things that we did, I spent about a year. I know people got tired of hearing me talk about the fourth industrial revolution. I know people got taught to be me about digital technology, but we see now that those things are necessary. So I want to talk about what MBDA is doing right now. Um, and I want everybody to know on the phone, and, and Michelle's an integral part of what we're doing and all of our centers are, MBDA is all the way in the fight trying to get minority businesses access to the PPP funding, to the EIDL loans, to the other federal resources and private investment. Because um, if webinars are great and we need webinars because webinars arouse awareness, right? You need to know where the money is and, that, and that's a great. But what I've been laser focused on is access because uh, we saw very early on that this was one of the time our minority businesses were ready. They knew about the SBA loans, they knew about some of these other loans out there and the grant opportunities, but we saw very early on that minority businesses had um, some significant barriers accessing the loans. And I don't want to dig too deep into the systematic barriers about uh, minority businesses and loans, but, but we have some data points that, sh that, that show that it's difficult for minority business owners to obtain small business funding. And the three biggest reasons why, and this is you know SBA data, is lower net worth. We know that wealth levels for Latinos and African Americans are about 11 to 16 times lower than for whites. We know that um, minority businesses tend to skew to be located in um, poor communities. And we know one of the major factors in the approval rating of small business loans for minorities is the location of the business in question. And we also know about the credit score issues. So we, so we knew that you know, the SBA was just one lever, but we've been pushing nonstop for direct emergency grant funding. Because we know that loans is, loans is great and we understand that people need opportunities to get loans, but people also need grant assistance. And that's one thing we've been pushing for. We pushed hard. We got $10 million in the CARES Act. I don't know if MBDA's ever got that kind of money before, but we got $10 million and we immediately started working with our centers on getting data on how, what, what has been the uptick and people asking for assistance. Um, what are the major hurdles that people are facing and how can we help with the processing? And those, that's some of the stuff that we did on the CARES Act stuff, but now we're focused on, because we had round one, we had round two, now we're really focused on the next supplemental. And for the next supplemental, I'll just say MBDA is pushing really, really, really hard on getting a bigger financial package because 10 million out of 2.2 trillion, and we're talking about over 11 million minority businesses, we know that um, MBDA is gonna have to be able to receive a bigger portion especially since we know that the banks aren't collecting the demographic information to see who's getting those loans. So that's, so that's kind of a policy landscape that I'm navigating some of the work that we're doing. And um, Michelle, if you want to go into Q&A right now, I'd be more than happy to. That's excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, you're right. We were always in the same book. I appreciate that you've never taken challenge personally. 
Um, at the end of the day, anyone advocating for minority business, uh, you, you absolutely know that you're not always going to agree with how to get there, but as long as we do get there together, that's what's uh, critical. And that's why we really wanted to highlight uh, a lot of the work being done by the agency. Um, we've established a couple of poll questions, and I'd like to start with one of them, because it really does center, as you talked about, the Paycheck Protection Program, and that has been uh, a point to start. So what I'd like to do, um, if our team can actually show that first poll question, um, the audience can actually participate by simply using um, your mouse. And the first question is very simple. How many entrepreneurs on the phone today applied for the SBA Paycheck Protection Program? If you'll quickly just uh, answer that, we'll give you a, a minute or so. So if we can see the results of that poll. It's like half of our attendees voted and here are the results. Okay. Um, those that applied um, uh, for the loan, about 56% of them. Um, and those that did not apply about 44%. Um, so as we look at that, um, I think it's important to share this information with Henry. I'd like to now see of those of you that chose to vote because you uh, were involved in this process, I'd like to know how many of those actually led to um, loans uh, being approved. And that's an SBA approval. I know that there's a bank approval and then you're placed into the SBA system and you get an ETRAN number. So please share that result. About 40% received approval. That's not a bad number um, compared to others that I've seen. So thank you for, for sharing those poll results. I think it's important that advocates like Henry hear directly from you because I do believe that there uh, are opportunities for them to continue to weigh in as there are discussions about what's happening in the country. Henry, from your perspective, really my first question um, along those lines, seeing that about 40% uh, of those that did apply out of the 60% the or so that applied, about 40% of those received loans can you tell us from your vantage point what you would advise for MBEs that are still looking at a liquidity um, um, issue in their companies and how you would actually advise them to look at not only federal resources, but perhaps even state resources to ensure their businesses uh, are continued and sustained? Yeah, that 40% is a very high number. I think that's a testament to the work that you're doing and the work that others are doing across the number that that's fantastic. Um, what, what I would, the things that I'm advising everybody to do right now is if there's a way to take advantage of the federal loans, then you do that, but make sure that you read very quickly what you're signing on to. Um, but can because it was important and there's percentages in there and I'm sure that everybody knows this, but I don't, what I don't want to happen is that I want people to receive funding. And then they find out when it's time to, you know, get the forgiveness that they didn't follow all the steps. So that's number one. If you did get funding, make sure that you're talking to people, especially your banks, and so that when it's time to get the loan forgiveness that you're able to do that. But the second thing that we're trying to do is uh, I've been working really hard on the private investment also. Um, and uh, I, there, was, there was a lot of private investment activity before um, the coronavirus. Now I've seen some of it lag and slow down. We're having the conversations again to say, okay, what can we do right now? Because it's really going to be two phases, right? It's going to be the response phase, which we're in right now, which is how do we keep businesses' doors open? How do we keep business doors open and they can start paying their employees? So that's going to be from now until probably the next 30, 60 days. Then the next question is, and this is a question I'm spending a lot of time on, is the recovery phase. Mm -hmm. um, because we as we're going to have to have a national strategy on how we start building wealth in our communities because when these disasters or whether it be you know uh, a virus whether it be a technology disaster whether it be a global disruption minority businesses are hit first they're hit hardest and it takes longer for us to rebound 
So at a certain point, we have to have some type of sustainable and inclusive growth strategy to, number one, not take the biggest hit, and number two, to rebound faster. Because I see these people talking about these V curves, right? They, and everybody wants to talk about the V. Okay, we're all dipping, but let's, let's go up faster. We're not taking these. We're take, I don't even know if it's a U. <laughs> a lot of times it's a flat line, and then we have a small uptick. And we can't have that anymore. So I've been working hard with, you know, civil, civil rights group, with business leaders, with um, foreign uh, direct investors, with nonprofits, with think tanks, everybody you can think of, because we are going to build a national plan for our um, minority communities, because we, we, we know that it's necessary. And if we do not rebound quickly, if we take a lag like we have in the past, then the national economy is not going to be able to rebound. If one in every three businesses is a minority business and minority businesses don't rebound quickly, it's going to have rem huge ramifications. Right. So, No, you're exactly right. You know, I, I've often said it's akin to the, the quip that you hear often. When the business community sneezes, minority business communities catch a cold. Um, and the reality... Right. The reality is it's, it's much more significant. I think we even see it when you look at the health disparities and the minority populations that have been adversely impacted um, by this pandemic. I believe most minority um, individuals would simply say, this is not a surprise to us, unfortunately. And for organizations like ours, it's the reason we work as hard as we do, because we know that economics drives all of this. So I, I appreciate your, your comments there. I, I would like to um, also really kind of pick your brain, um, Director Childs, in terms of what you see on the horizon. I know we've had a number of questions that have come through from people that are saying, look, we heard this is the second round of funding. And as you talked about, at some point we have to move beyond this phase to the next, but do you foresee that there will be additional rounds of funding um, that would perhaps include programs like an additional round of funding for paycheck protection? So, I, I, yeah, to answer that question, yes, but also we've been, like I mentioned, we've been in, I've been on nonstop calls with the White House, with Congress, um, with my own Department of Commerce on this next package, and I can tell you that everybody is aware um, that MBDA is a huge resource. They're aware of some of the things that we can do, and um, I'm not going to make a, I'm not going to make a huge prediction, but I can tell you the feedback I'm getting is that MBDA will be in the mix for another round of funding. And they're also looking at tweaks to make the SBA, if, a PP, if there is another PPP, um, there have been calls for, and this is not in stone, but these are just some of the things we've been hearing, calls for maybe some demographic information to be put in there so that we know who exactly is getting it. There's been talks on better translation um, technical assistance. We know that SBA did a good, uh, good job translating the documents for Hispanic speakers, but not so much for Asian Americans. I've heard a lot of outcry from our Asian American community that, you know, the translation services weren't available. So how can you apply for this stuff if you have trouble, you know, reading it and knowing it's on there? And also, I want to make a big push for our Native American businesses. I mean, we, we, we often don't talk about it, but when you talk about, you know, disruptions and we talk about having trouble getting resources and funding, um, our Native American businesses are really, really, really struggling, and we've been working hard for them on that. Um, but where do we go? I, I mean, I, I, I cannot stress enough how important it is for minority businesses to embrace a global and a digital strategy. I, I, I mean, now that's, that's what I'm doing when I'm locked in my apartment all day. I am thinking of ways. How do we have growth? I mean, we do business development, but to me, you cannot talk about development if you're not talking about growth. At a certain point, that 2% number has to be 3% of MBEs grossing a million dollars, then it has to be 5%, then it has to be 10%. I mean, until we get to that point, we're going to be having the same conversations with the same people, talking about the same strategies. We need some humongous minority businesses. 
I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And you know, that's where you and I have actually bonded. Um, I have often said, and I don't mind saying again, doing supplier diversity the same way it's been done for years and years is not going to create sustainable high growth businesses for the future. Um, one of the things that I think we have the privilege as minority communities, we are used to adversity. We are used to overcoming adversity and certainly have learned uh, throughout um, our history. And you can look at each minority community that we represent and see very concrete examples of how they have overcome throughout history. So I must say, I was excited to see the nation's uh, MBDA Center Network come together and figure out ways to look at sourcing strategies to say, yes, we are in the middle of a crisis. And at that point, um, I believe 98% of the country was sheltering in place at home. But we said, we're not going to sit back. Instead, we see this as an opportunity to grow minority businesses. And we've been able to do that. I'm very proud to say that when we look at that network, when we look at all of the NMSDC affiliate presidents that joined in on that, we were able to literally come together and connect buyers and suppliers in a way that has now introduced new markets and new opportunities to business owners. Tell me of some of the instances, and I know you have the ability um, and the privilege of hearing from minority businesses throughout the country. If you were an entrepreneur today, how would you be looking at a pivot? So let's say you are in a product or service and you can pick uh, any industry, but give us some examples of how you've either seen people pivot or how you've advised them to look at their business and certainly see the, certain, the current crisis as an opportunity for future growth. Thank you for that. The, um, the two big ones are um, leveraging e-commerce. So I will say that, you know, MBDA, and I'm very proud to say this, we are collaborating with Amazon to help minority businesses um, basically go do more business online. And this includes Amazon, basically one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. It helps people with their, you know, marketing and sales so that you can, you know, improve your chances on getting the first page of Amazon. I mean, it links you in with their uh, distribution centers. This is stuff, this is the first time Amazon has ever had a carve out for minority businesses. It's called the Minority Business and Technology Initiative. And that is huge because e-commerce is going to continue to grow. Um, and I'm glad to say that we are um, working with Amazon to make sure that minority businesses grow in this trillion dollar industry. So that's number one, e-commerce. But number two, what the, the, an example of what I'm really seeing is hard times force people who don't have the propensity to work together to work together. I have seen a huge uptick in joint ventures and potential mergers. And I think that is great because one way to uh, become a million dollar company you combine two 500,000 ones and I can tell you one company for example was an Hispanic business they um, they were just a regular you know business I think they, they were in the um, food services industry but they actually joint did a joint venture with a technology company right because they're like hey we don't have the expertise in-house and we don't have the time to do it so let's just merge with someone who has the technology and their, their business has already exploded a hundred times from what they made last year. And it's just a simple fact of doing joint ventures. A lot of times, um, because minority businesses literally are their own lawyers or own accountants, like you don't know what you don't know. So you assume you have to do everything yourself. You have to be scrappy. And we oftentimes don't say, Hey, why not hire or why not, uh, team up with someone who has what I don't have and what I don't have time to learn. I don't have the money to learn and you just do it. So I encourage teaming, joint ventures, mergers. That is a way for uh, minority businesses to grow. Absolutely. I think those are outstanding examples. Digitization alone. Um, uh, I'll start with that one. 
um, just when you think about digitization, and there are still uh, webinars, as, as I understand, taking place throughout the country. So you should look at the MBDA uh, website. And if you've not availed yourself of some of those great Amazon uh, resources being offered through MBDA, please do that. Um, one of the questions that we've gotten about digitization is really talking about startups, in particular in the technology space, and any funds that you might be aware of to shore up those businesses as they start, or really any small business as it's getting started. Are you aware of any particular funds that are geared toward people that have an innovative uh, product or solution that they're trying to bring to market? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I want to talk about some current grant opportunities that MBDA has specifically. Um, right now, if you go on our website, www.mda.gov, you'll see some notice of funding opportunities. And I want to speak, highlight two of them. The first one is our Enterprising Women of Color um, uh, uh, grant announcement. And it's going to, it's about $1.5 million in funding for MBDA. And this really helps our women of color entrepreneurs who the data shows have a harder time getting, getting funding. So we decided, hey, we need to get some skin in the game so we have those and they're currently out. The second one you mentioned technology is our inner city innovation grant. And I'm, I'm really, really, really proud about this. This is some, one of the innovative pieces that I've been pushing forward. We know that about 76% of the minority population lives in inner cities, but less than one quarter of all inner city businesses are minority owned. So if three fourths of our population lives in inner cities, but less than a quarter of minority businesses or in those communities, we need to build some infrastructure because I, I cannot explain to you how tired I am of hearing people talk about economic development, but they don't talk about the minority businesses in those communities. Right. You cannot do economic development if you're not developing the minority businesses right. in the cities. Exactly. <laughs> so we're, that's what we're doing. We are, we are taking the steps, we are doing the seed work to actually start investing in the businesses that are in the place where people live. I, I think that's outstanding. Honestly, Detroit is a great example of that. Um, we have done um, some tremendous work here, um, but when you look at uh, the work that still needs to be done, it's within those communities, in the neighborhoods in Detroit where people live and work. And quite honestly, again, going back to this pandemic, you see the lack of that economic development in the health disparities that were um, really kind of surfaced through this. So, so thank you for that. I now want to talk about your, your other example that you offered, which is really that of collaboration. Um, and, and I must say, that is uh, the wave of the future. I was listening to uh, Mark Cuban recently, owner of the Dallas Mavericks uh, dot com billionaire. And he said he was asked, uh, what would be the main thing you would tell people in an environment of low cash flow? And he said, the number one thing I would tell them is your competitors can become your partners. And that way you increase your ability to take on this monumental task of riding the ship and maintaining your business and actually not just maintaining it, but growing it. So I, I think your comments are spot on there. I wanna shift uh, to one of the questions. We have um, an excellent question here. Um, it's a bit lengthy, but I will read it because I think it does provide some context. Uh, with those of us who have re received the PPP loan, does it really make the best sense to use the loan as intended as a grant? The PPP is intended for about two months of payroll expenses, but many companies don't see themselves back operating within this time frame. Does it make more sense to use this money as a loan to weather a longer storm and worry about a 1% loan versus betting on not being in business in two months and potentially broke? <laughs> I know. So, uh... <laughs> You'd be better off answering that question. You know, you know, I would love to answer that question, but I, I, I cannot okay. advise someone on something like that. I, I, the best answer is, you know, your business better than anybody. You know, your circumstances better than anybody. So if it makes sense to have a longer term strategy, then have a longer term strategy. If it makes sense to use it as a loan, to use it as a loan. 
Yeah. You know, I will say I have, uh, I've been participating on uh, multiple webinars and um, I'm not giving you legal or accounting advice. Here's what I would say. I do think this is a question that is an excellent question to sit down with your CPA and really talk about it. One of the questions I've heard throughout the country um, on various webinars where I've been invited to serve as a panelist is what happens because now that we've gotten our, our PPP loan and we've gone through saving paychecks, we literally have employees that are making more money on unemployment and they don't want to come back to work. That is a small business, a true small business concern. And how do you actually handle that? Uh, or what do you do? Because even when we're bringing them back to work, they're reluctant to come back because they'd rather make unemployment. And we're reluctant to bring them back because our operation isn't fully open yet. And I think uh, the best advice I have there is in that particular situation, I think what you have to look at to Henry's point is we should now be looking um, as much as we possibly can about recovery, truly looking at how do we recover our business. And if that's the case, and I'm in a business where perhaps I need a social media campaign and I have people on my payroll that I know spend an, in our, <laughs> an inordinate amount of time on social media, perhaps them coming back to work, even though your physical location isn't open, is helping to devise that type of strategy. I think we have to get very creative um, in the way that we're approaching this. I agree that this is a very technical question. I, I wanted to pose it to you because I'm sure mm -hmm. there are others on the phone grappling with it. I would say my, my, my true advice is every scenario is going to be a bit different. And this is really a question where I would advise that people uh, work with their actual CPA firm. Can I add on to something you said? Because I think that you hit something critical when you started talking about recovery and will the employees come back? I think, and Michelle, you know this, we have been reading every single article and seeing all the data on the future of work. And I can tell you right now, the biggest corporations in the world are already moving towards either a fully um, automated strategy or an augmentation strategy. And I stay in the augmentation because I think that humans and machines can work together to create benefits for society at scale. But now is the time, now is a good time to start looking at things like, and this, and this is just basic AI, things like robot process automation, things like, you know, digitization. How can you increase um, your growth, how can you do more through technology? I think technology now more than ever can help our businesses, number one, uh, sustain this storm and weather the storm, but number two, rebound quicker. So, and also the training, because a lot of times, and I've been guilty of this, you run out there and you talk about artificial intelligence, but we don't talk about skilling up our employees to be able to do these things. So digital skills is something that I've been working on really hard the last three months so that we have the, the talent to take these jobs that we know are coming. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Does MBDA have any programs, uh, Director Childs, where you are really uh, starting to look at how we ensure that that workforce is prepared? I understand um, in terms of leveraging technology that you're doing so, but are there any other things that uh, you're considering perhaps or programs that are happening throughout the country um, that we should be aware of? So um, last year we did kind of a, I, I don't want to call it a pilot, a pilot, but we did a little collaboration with Drexel University um, and we had some, you know, packages to basically work with them to give, basically allow minority businesses at a discount to get some of these digital skills. That's something that we're looking on um, to, after we get the data on how successful it was to scale out and maybe do nationally. That's awesome. That's outstanding. Excellent. Continue to ask your questions and I will come back to those. Um, I, I want to shift the conversation a bit. We were just talking about it, but I'd like to look at uh, the third poll question there. I'm very interested, especially in light of uh, the last uh, live question that we took um, in this question. Um, and it's really in your estimation, is your company's financial position likely to sustain business for zero to three months? four to six months or seven to 12 months. I think your answers here could be very helpful um, to Director Childs as he advocates uh, on behalf of minority businesses and can understand really our current state. As I said earlier, I think so many of our larger businesses learned from the 2008 recession and they had contingency plans. When we first started reaching out to them in late February, they were ready 
um, and had taken steps and uh, simply needed to know uh, what the next steps of their customers were. So we've had a few minutes if we can now review the results of this poll. Okay, um, really evenly divided um, amongst the four to six months, seven to 12 months. So about 40%, um, about seven to 12 months, um, four to six months, uh, 36%, and zero to three months, about 25%. Um, I think this is uh, vital information. Thank you uh, for sharing that screen. I think it's vital information, uh, Director Childs, as you advocate for us. Um, if you look at that, 40% believe within seven to 12 months, um, there would be great disruption in their business um, if this continues. And we've certainly listened to the scientists, um, but I think it's important that we share that type of feedback with you so that you see and understand the plight of our businesses. A quarter of the people in that poll are simply saying they're not even sure they can make it for the next three months. Is there any advice that you would have for them during this period of time um, as to how, um, how they might uh, look, at, look at their business and ensuring that they uh, actually thrive throughout this period? Yeah, I would, number one thing I would say is uh, leverage the network and I would re reach out to Michelle um, because Michelle I, and I and I have to say this uh, been so aggressive and such a leader in making sure that minority businesses have all the resources they need um, and, and that's why I love working with you is because you're a fighter. Number two, I would send, I, I'm accumulating data because when I have conversations with the Congress or with White House, the best thing that I can do is when I can say, when I can say hey, I've, taken, I've, I've heard from, and I'm making this up, 500 um, minority businesses in the you know, technology space, and here are their top three concerns, right? So what we're doing is since we're working on this next package, data is more important than anything to get the right amount that we need. I mean, I'll give you an example. We took a, a poll from our business centers, we had a 70% response rate, and they said that they've been that there were a million minority a million minority businesses who reached out and said that they needed assistance. So that's the type of information that when we share with Congress, we make sure that we get the right size package because it's not just federal dollars. We're also looking at private sector solutions to this, and and I cannot express how much data is important when those dollars start going out. What to fund? And the second thing is alignment. And I've not spoken about this earlier, but it's critical once we get the data and once we're able to figure out what the top, you know, let's say a 10 needs, let's say a recommendation sheet, that we're on the same page. Because a lot of different times, I mean, you'll talk to 50 businesses for recommendations and you'll get 40 different ideas that don't align. Our best friend right now is if we have one voice advocating for minority businesses. And the voice should be, we come together and we say, hey, here's our list of recommendations that speak for the entire group, because that has power in it. When you're able to, and this is what I've been working on, when you're able to say, this is what industry wants in an alliance with what our um, policy people want, in an alliance with what our minority business owners want, and it aligns with what the market wants. When you're able to say all of those things are in tandem and here's our list, that is powerful because mm -hmm. people could ignore you when you're, when you're singular or when you're running in different directions. But when you are unified, that's when you cannot be ignored. Right. That's a very, very good point. And I have to say, I think often uh, we don't understand our voice as entrepreneurs. So the, the thing I would say, the, the director can't challenge you here, but I will. I'm not asking you to go and become lobbyists and be at Capitol Hill every day, but your delegation, in particular the Michigan delegation, we as a council uh, work with them, not as an MBDA center um, because we're receiving federal funds there, but as a council, we are constantly educating them about uh, minority business. So as I've shared some of the solutions that we've provided in helping people gain access to loans, helping people understand how to pivot their businesses and how to find new sourcing opportunities that might be out there on another in another part of the country where they, they didn't have connection. Those are all things that we share. And I would invite any of you as citizens, um, I believe 
believe uh, you have lawmakers that are hyper-focused and hypersensitive right now to understanding what's happening in the small business community. So use your voice in a, in a very powerful way. I know we have people on this call from throughout the country um, supporting uh, Director Childs. And what I would say is let's leverage our collective voice to make sure um, that our lawmakers do understand. It's one thing to ask Director Childs um, and the MBDA agency in, in Washington, D.C. to advocate on our behalf, but it is another thing altogether for us to simply let people know the impact of, of the work that's being done there. Uh, along those lines, um, I'd like to look at um, really one of our final poll questions um, today because I think it would be important for you, uh, Director Childs, to see and hear from this group as to where they would like for you to focus. In terms of the services, what would be most helpful to you in the coming months? Access to sourcing opportunities for growth, access to capital for sustainability, access to up-to-date information on various programs and solutions that are there to build your knowledge base, and then access to consultations on how to pivot your business to attract new markets and new customers. Please answer this poll question. And again, I, I think um, in doing so, I know some of you aren't answering the question. Some of you are probably on phones and things like that and other devices where it's not easy. But I would ask you to answer this because I think, as he just said, he is accumulating data and that data actually helps him to go and know what to fight for. He and I have bonded because we're both fighters and we both love minority communities and want to see them, them thrive. So let's see how they're asking um, services to be provided. The results of that poll, please. Okay, um, about 57% want access. We want to grow. We want to understand sourcing. Um, the next would be consultations on how to pivot. Um, I'm I'm ex I'm actually surprised and excited to see that it's not all about capital because at the end of the day, I think if we provide opportunities for sourcing and growth, that is. Um, your liquidity that you need for your business to thrive if we provide opportunities to help you pivot. So that's excellent. I appreciate uh, your responses there. So I, um, I'd like to continue the conversation and I please, the, the group is reminding me that I need to ask you to ask questions. So please do submit your question through the Q&A button there um, for uh, additional questions. We have time for about uh, 10 minutes uh, more, five or 10 minutes more of questions. And if you do have a burning question, please feel free um, to ask that now. Um, I'd like to shift the focus uh, to you, Director Childs. So as you look at, in particular, um, some of the things that uh, will be taking place um, in the economy, as you look at globalization, what do you believe the impact of this pandemic will be on how we look at um, MBEs that are working oftentimes throughout um, other nations to bring products and services here to the U.S.? I, I think that basically um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that I think what we've been working hard on since I've been at MBDA since 2018 just got accelerated. Right, like we saw the data, we know the future of work's coming. We know that the largest companies are looking to do more through technology and they're looking to do more with remote workers. And that's what we're seeing. Like if you could, if you could say, what would the next 25 years look like? I think it just happened like sooner. And, and, and it's very unfortunate that this huge disruption happened, but as you can see the companies who were preparing for this or the ones who aren't just, you know, being sustainable, they're actually making profit. So right. to me, to me, this should be a glimpse into the future of what uh, the future of work could look like. Um, and it should be an opportunity for minority businesses to figure out how to get digital and get global as fast as possible. Um, and I think that we have advantages, especially with global. I mean, if you, if you just look at, all the growth coming in across the world, it tends to be in countries and continents of people who look like us. Right. And we have, I mean, I, I did, I'll give you an example. I did a business development trip to Mexico City, took about 12 Hispanic companies, were in Mexico City for two to three days. Literally, we came back 
with $100 million in opportunities and a $12 million contract signed. And it's because, obviously, you know, there's cultural advantages there. There's language advantages there. It's, it's easy to do business. We're doing it in Africa. We're doing it in Asia. So, to me, now is the time, one of the first times in history where our – culture is actually something that the market is looking for and we need to exploit it now is not the time to run away from being a minority business now is the time to run to it because when you're doing business globally chances are you're going to be doing business with somebody who looks similar to you or shares the same values and values and trust or key in business right now. Um, so I say run to global, run to digital, um, and these are things that Michelle can help you with. These are things that you know I've been pressing forward, leaning to, or trying to get businesses to do. And the only question I've had is how to get more people to do it quickly enough so that we're able to see some growth. Outstanding. You know, I have to tell you, um, I have seen um, some amazing work by our MBEs leveraging their global connections. Um, and there are many um, stories that I can share from MBEs, um, in particular, um, a lot of our Chinese American MBEs that have worked so very hard um, in those early weeks when PPE was, you know, just a hot commodity, not that it isn't today, but when it was really, um, it was horrible to see images of healthcare workers in garbage bags as their isolation gowns had run out of stock. Um, but our MBEs, I'm so excited about what our Asian community um, bound together and came in and provided products and services. And many of them ended up donating uh, products um, if they really knew that their local healthcare systems were in need uh, because they had that direct connection. And we often talk about that, but I think we've seen it play out in real time here that one of the um, true benefits of working with minority suppliers is their access to the globe um, for very natural, um, natural reasons there. Um, one of the questions that we have here is uh, about my comment earlier about supplier diversity. The reason I think supplier diversity, as we've done it in the past, no longer works, it has grown stale. It has not responded to the marketplace and the market's needs. When I look at our supplier diversity programs and the fact that they are centered often just around events, they are centered around events that don't give you access to true decision makers and within corporations. And I'll just take um, my own uh, vantage point here in Michigan, for example, 30 years ago, we had senior executives in major corporations that looked at supplier diversity and said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this and make an impact. We're not talking about a $50,000 contract, we're talking about a $50 million contract, and how do we begin to prepare minority business owners to do that? So if anything, I see that there has to be total disruption in this space. This is not an event driven. We have to make sure we're attuned with the organizations that we're dealing with, whether it is a, a federal or state agency or a major corporation. We need to understand where their business is going. By the time the RFP is out there, typically it's too late. Yet we have programs that are literally built around how do we actually go after an RFP program? How do we provide X, Y, and Z in terms of resources. Here's a list of suppliers and nobody is working from that anymore. What we have to do is real time, it's live, it's getting in there, it's understanding what corporations need. I won't reveal the name of the corporation, but we had a major healthcare, national healthcare organization contact us and say, we need help identifying minority suppliers that can meet a need. We were able to pull together a team of staff members that literally looked, researched, vetted, and went through the specifications to identify the best business owners for them. That's how I believe we have to pivot. I believe we have to pivot and we have to do things like going to Silicon Valley and inviting organizations like Plug and Play to say, if we see that we have a huge void of minority supply in the tech space. When I went to the Consumer Electronics Show a couple of years, I was taken aback at the lack of diversity throughout the floor. You've got literally every country in the world almost represented there. But when I looked for 
minority suppliers, I couldn't find them. And I began to look around and say, why is that? Where are the disconnects? So we partnered with a Silicon Valley plug and play minority business development agency and director Childs, Bill and his team have been integrally involved in that because we will now build an incubator in Detroit that's all geared toward innovation, but it has a 40% goal of ensuring that minorities and women are included. We have to be very intentional. It's not a bad thing to say that we actually have a goal and we're going to work to meet that goal. We're going to work to eliminate barriers to that goal. But somehow I think we've whitewashed a lot of our programming and we're too afraid to say what really is. And that is that a lot of our corporate programs need a complete makeover so that they can offer real opportunities. A lot of our minority business enterprises need a complete makeover so that when a corporation gives them an opportunity, they are ready. They hit the ground running and like it or not, they are representing an, a litany of people behind them and they take that responsibility and privilege so seriously that they are certain that they're going to knock it out of the park. That's what I mean when I say we can shift this narrative if we work together. And we've decided instead of continuing to talk about it, we are going to just do it. And that's why we've tried to identify like-minded people like Director Childs who are willing to make those, those uh, uh, leaps because it is a very different way of looking at the way that we do work. We don't ever charge a buyer to attend our trade show because I'm not trying to make money from buyers. I'm trying to get a buyer actually there so that they can make connection with all of the other MBEs that are there. Those are the mindset shifts that we have to make in a manner that actually makes a difference. And I see people like Director Childs on the front line doing that day in and day out. And I'm so excited that he's taken the time with us today. So I wanna wrap up and give him a couple of minutes just to give you his parting thoughts and, and share with you uh, any final words of wisdom and then I will close us out. So Director Childs. Yeah, thank you. So I, I just wanna, follow up with what you just said to me the only way or the fastest way you disrupt diversity is development okay the, the, the way this whole diversity space started was we have capable able minority businesses who are being locked out of access to these contracting to financing to markets now what we're saying is who is doing the development to even have the conversation with these companies that, hey, we have 50 MBEs in Detroit who are ready to be primed. If we do not focus on developing our minority businesses, then diversity is going to, it's not going, it's not going to be significant or relevant enough for people to change. So my whole focus has been on minority business development. And the number one question the market wants to know is, are you developing new concepts and new capabilities? Because if you're not innovative, then they're looking at you as a cost. Mm -hmm. And if they're looking at you in a cost in the age of commoditization, you're going to have trouble convincing them that they need to invest any more money in you. So we are laser focused on innovation and the companies who are growing and who are scaling are innovation companies. We, I want to advocate for you that we want to be your research and your development wing so that we can make sure that whenever this new technology comes or there's a new market opportunity that you're ready because we've been working to develop you. And so I could not agree with you more. We have to disrupt this uh, diversity, but it's through development. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I appreciate all of you joining us today. I see a couple of, of, of notes here, a, a final question here about how do I get my products and services into this portal? The matchmaker portal is simple. Um, it's minority supplier.org forward slash COVID-19 matchmaker, minoritysupplier.org forward slash COVID-19 matchmaker. Um, it's our commitment to uh, reply to you within 48 to 72 hours um, and to begin to connect you to people that are looking for the particular product or service that you buy. Um, I want to close with, with this thought. Um, um, first, let me do this though. Let me thank the team. I totally forgot to do that at the opening. So I thank uh, uh, MBDA Director Bill Grice, 
um, uh, Dorothy Huddleston, who has uh, been working uh, with our team in really uh, reconfiguring our design series to address all of the needs during COVID-19. I also want to thank uh, Bridget Daly, Dan Jackson for some of their technical support today and, and making sure things happened and we were able to move. Last but not least, I want to thank you, uh, Director Childs, for the work that you've done, um, for your courageous um, pursuit of all the resources that are necessary for minority businesses and your unapologetic, um, uh, your unapologetic um, voice that you have lent to say minority businesses matter and we are going to take every step that we can to ensure that they can compete with the best of them. My, my parting thought, I was thinking as you talked earlier, is, is just this. As a child, I was told that true courage meant that when there was a crisis, you didn't run away from the scene, but you ran toward it. And I have seen you do that. And I just want to thank you on behalf of the MBDA centers around the country. And I know some of uh, my peers are on this call, but also for the many minority businesses that are being served. Thank you for helping us to run toward that crisis and create opportunity out of it, because we know that the work we do certainly builds wealth in those uh, entrepreneurs, but it also helps their employees and the communities that we all care about. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Director Child and thank you to the entire uh, Detroit MBDA Center team and MMSDC team. Have a wonderful day.